Sarah De La Salle, I'm with Friends of Cootenay Lake, and I'm here just to share with you some lessons learned from the wetland we built last year out at Harrop. And then I'm going to pass it over to Reagan, and she's going to tell you about a new exciting that she's working, our new project she's working with um, this year. So last year we got funding to do a wetland restoration project out in Harrop. This is Eric, one of our volunteers, planting in some trees on the foreshore. Um, so today I'm just kind of going to go over, you know, how did we get the money, what did we do, um, and kind of some of the processes that I thought you might find useful if you want to do your own wetland work. So the first thing you want to do when you're building a wetland is find your candidate. And so that, people have different approaches for doing this, but um, the approach I took was kind of values and threats. So it has high ecological values. Um, Harrop is one of the most incredible places on the lake. It represents um, riparian habitat, which is really rare on the west arm of Kootenai Lake because it is so developed. There's great blue heron, western toad, painted turtle, all of which are species at risk. Um, it has incredible juvenile fish rearing habitat. Um, there was an official ecological assessment done there. Uh, tons of plants and animals um, present on site. And the values are being threatened um, both by historic uses, so the wetland had been historically drained from agriculture, which is really common, um, and then also current disturbance issues. So um, we had been, uh, I had been called several times with concerns about ATV disturbance in a sensitive wetland area. So part of our project was to work with um, compliance and enforcement staff to try to figure out um, a solution to that problem. So just for a quick, I thought we were Columbia Basin watershed. So the Kootenai Lake watershed, you know, we start up in Kootenai National Park, come down, this is where Rachel's doing her bird work in Canal Flats. Kootenai River comes down through Montana, through Libby Dam, up Idaho, and then flows up by where Tom and those guys are in Crawford Bay, out this way. There, it also, major inflow coming down from the Duncan Lardo Dam, um, and then going out the west arm that way. So here, is just on the west arm, which is right about here. Um, so where do we get the money? Fish and Wildlife's uh, Compensation Program gave us about 8,100, and Environment Canada, through their Eco Action Grant, gave us just over 27. So excellent sources for money if you want to do wetland work. Another one is the National Wetland Fund. So it's a whole fund that's been set up um, nationwide to support wetland work. So if you're interested in doing the work, great sources of funding. Uh, word to the wise, you can't get Environment Canada Eco Action Grant and the National Wetland Fund for the same project, so you kind of have to pick one or the other on that. And then just wanted to recognize we had a huge amount of in-kind for this project, so just over 23,000 in in-kind, and this is Rami with the um, Harrop, or Procter Forest products, they donated us this flat deck of large woody debris. So, a ton of local um, in-kind investment. Uh, Tor Smestad should be recognized. He has a local um, tr uh, native tree nursery, and he donated a ton of in-kind to our project. So thanks to all that. Um, I might actually just flip to a quick picture here. Um, so what did we do? Um, what we did was, um, sorry, I was trying to see full screen. There we go. Um, so this is what we did. So um, this is here. Right here is Regional District Park. And so what we did is this area here, this tiny little pond, um, for years it would dry out. Western toads would breed. And then the pond would dry out before the tadpoles had time to change into um, toadlets and move out of their aquatic state. And so we had locals coming and collecting all the tadpoles in fish tanks and raising them, and so we wanted to create a more permanent solution. Solution. So we got in there, enlarged it by boat six times, played in there with a 325 cat, um, and, and did some work there. Here we planted 80 cottonwood, so you can actually see, there used to be a giant cottonwood stand here with a heron rookery. This is private. Here you can see the big pile of cut down cottonwoods here. So they decided many years ago that they didn't like the dead cottonwood stand, so we're trying to replace that habitat that was lost there by building up the stand here. Uh, we're hoping in the long term that combining extra food with the western toads here, which great blue heron eat, and increasing their roosting habitat, that we can bring back some herons to the area here. They're, they already hang out there, but we're trying to bring them back in bigger numbers. 
These two ponds here is where I was talking about that incredible juvenile fish rearing habitat. So as some of you know, there is a kokanee decline on Kootenai Lake fisheries. Um, it's really important the lake has been really impacted by um, historic um, dam installations. So what we did, this is where there was a lot of ATV activity. So it made a great, lots of jumps, lots of mud, lots of fun stuff. I ATV, so I can appreciate it being fun. But ATVing in a wetland, not such a good choice. So we worked with community members to figure out a solution. And what we ended up doing was planting on the first slide, Eric putting in those tall shrubs. So we planted shrubs all along that purple line and put interpretive signs. So kind of used a natural uh, barrier mixed with um, interpretive signs to try to use a bit of education um, combined with the, the actual physical barrier. Um, we, we did a ton of consultation. We did four community planning sessions um, and we established a citizen science amphibian monitoring group. That's my mom. She came up from the Okanagan for the course. So we worked with Jacob Delise, who's a local amphibian expert, and um, we brought community members down there because we wanted to assess, okay, what's down there before we do the restoration? What are, what's there after? Were we actually successful with our goal? Because we were very specific. We wanted to have improved western toad breeding habitat. So this was the wetland before. It was seasonally flooded. Some years it would never get wet. And then, it, as you can see, it's some good kind of amphibian habitat that we're all tromping around in there. But um, So we did um, consult with the Tanaka Nation Council. That's Nicole Capel and Chad Luke. They came out um, and just made sure that we weren't going to dig around in any potential archaeological sites. So if you are making wetlands, definitely call the Tanaka or whoever First Nations you're in because a lot of times wetland can overlap with um, historic archaeological sites because you know there's a lot of riches to wetlands in terms of food and medicine so um, those two can often overlap. So this was the pond pre-restoration. So essentially it had been used as a cattle watering hole. The farmer went in there and this had been used as a cattle watering hole. It's ephemeral which means it dries out part of the year. So what we did, we went there Murray with Murray and his machine and we enlarged the wetland by about six times. We made um, different pools, deepened it. Um, we raised the height of the outflow so we could keep more water in there. Um, there was a lot of beautiful sedge in there. So what we did, we scalped it off, set it aside, and then set it back to kind of save some of that good plant. There was also tons of reed canary grass. So when we scalped it off, we ended up piling all the reed canary, which is uh, not a very nice plant into these big piles, capped it with soil, and then replanted it with native plants just to try to deal with all this material we had because I didn't want to spread this canary grass all over a beautiful sedge meadow. So we just decided to pile it and, and put native plants over top, so we'll see how that works this year. Yeah, so we created small pools. Um, so this picture doesn't show it very well. This is after the restoration. Um, so we buried, we did this in two locations, a uh, painted turtle really liked to nest in areas with fine sand and large woody debris. So this back here is a big tree and um, we half buried it in sand. So we have another one of those over here in the restoration site. Um, so we did some painted turtle nesting habitat, lots of loafing logs. Um, so right now we designed the project to dry out for part of the year. And so right now this project is actually looking pretty dry, drier than I'd like it. So we're going to have to monitor it this year and potentially alter something the next year if we don't get enough water in there that we wanted. It has been an exceptionally dry year and this wetland does rely on rain and the lake levels coming up and flooding over. So just something to think about if this is a sign of things to come with climate change really dry years. I think whenever we're restoring wetlands, we really need to take this in mind and take in mind low water years and how can we still make our projects, um, you know, achieve the goals um, even on dry, on really dry years. So just some food for thought on that one. Um, we collected, a, there's a beautiful sedge population there. So we did, a, we collected uh, this seed before we went in the excavator and spread it out using some of the native seed stuff. Lots of volunteer involvement. This is Tim helping us out. We threw straw down everywhere to stabilize the soil. I was really excited about this. We made a snake hibernaculum. So snakes need places to go in the winter where they don't freeze to death. 
And so what we did was we dug about a 10 foot by 10 foot hole, about six feet deep, and we filled it with, uh, we, I got him to sort this rock out, so we kept a lot of kind of the bigger stuff for the bottom. We mixed it with all sorts of root wads, and then we put these four foot perforated PVC pipes down into it so the snakes can access whatever layer they want. Capped it with uh, landscaping fabric, um, so kind of like a mohawk over the top, so the snake can still access the sides on both of the sides. So, I don't know, we'll see if anybody <coughs> uses it. It might take a couple years before we can figure out if anyone uses it. Even if the snakes don't use it, it might turn into like a ground squirrel palace or something like that. <laughs> something, something might use it. Uh, so this is what we did on the foreshore. Um, there was some existing willow, but what we did is we just fortified it with um, red osier dogwood and Sitka willow, that's what all this is. Um, we painted it with a latex sand mixture which just allows it so the beavers don't eat it and the deer don't eat it for the first year. And then that allows them to kind of get established and then after that the deer and the beaver can chew and they can regrow. But they at least need one year to kind of establish. But behind here is all the big ponds and here's Kootenai Lake. So you see there's a bit of sedge population here. So we're hoping that by kind of over time we can create this whole vegetative barrier and more veg can establish here and yeah. Um, so we did some interpretive science. Um, this is one Terry Anderson with the province was helping us install it, but it basically says, please do not disturb sensitive wildlife habitat and then a little fish at the bottom saying thanks. So we tried to take like a really positive approach um, I wanted to show you guys, as we were doing this project, um, there was a really cool initiative by Redfish School. And all the kids, elementary school students, they each did an individual watercolor. And so they made four signs for four different types of critter. And every kid in the school has their artwork up at the Harrop Wetlands. So for our open house, we had like 90 kids running around all like, stoked to see their artwork up. So they actually allowed us to use some of this artwork on our interpretive signs that we made. So it was kind of like this perfect thing that they were doing their work, we were doing our work, and it was really complimentary. And it's like there was such a negative tone there between the ATV people and the non-ATV people that when you kind of bring in the kids, and it's like it kind of neutralizes that, I found, and it, it just takes a positive approach. It's like saying, hey, there's some values here. Don't be a jerk, basically. And I think that the uh, the kids' artwork and I I don't know. I'm I'm hopeful. No incidents yet. So um, hopefully people like. I think it's important if you are trying to change in behavior. You know, you can't just put like an ATV with an X. You need to have some positivity. Say you know that there's actually really good reason behind behind what we're trying to do. Um, so we consulted. So much. Uh, Gordy, who came out with me one time from the West Arm Outdoors Club. Um, I, one thing that's really important when you're first beginning your project, even before you apply for your funding, I like to say, gather your Aries. So for me, the first thing I did was I had Carrie Gaynor with RDCPA Parks, Terry Anderson um, with the province, and Harry Vialis um, with the province as well, these uh, natural resource officers. And those were really the, the first meeting, they were the landowners, and Harry had dealt with the long-standing C&E issues of the site. So first step, I just recommend gather those few key people to talk about what you actually want to do, what, what your goals could be, and that's really a first step before you go out and get your money. Um, but we did consult a lot. Um, it, because, you know, you might not have to do this as much. I've worked on other wetland projects on private land and you can kind of just hopscotch that, this whole process. This was super costly. Like, you know, doing four community planning sessions, I probably did five on-sites with different um, people within these organizations. So, consultation's expensive, but it's worth it in the end. Uh, the wetland design, so we were very fortunate. We kind of uh, piggybacked on um, with some other projects and were able to get Tom Babyhauser out to design our wetlands. So Jerry's worked with Tom before doing some wetland work and many, maybe some of you have as well, but Tom's a world-renowned wetland expert that lives in the States. He's built over 1,500 wetlands across the world. Um, and so he came and helped us out to design and then came back to help ensure that the design, uh, that the work actually met the design. So 
Tom really helped out with that. Um, and that was really what I wanted to share with you guys. So did you have any questions on wetland restoration work? Yes. So how effective is the, the latex paint to keep the beavers in bay? Well, that's a Tor Smested, that's his experiment, and I wouldn't even call it experiment. He's done it for a number of years, and it's extremely effective. It's extremely effective. The deer just hate that. It's like me and me and peach skin. It's like this is the best. So they just don't like it. So I, I definitely recommend anytime you're doing work in restoration area, it's an awesome solution to protect your plants. Um, Todd. Tom. Tom. Sorry, Tom. Claire, I, I would, it's not a question, but I would like to stand up and say thank you for the wonderful work you and your group have oh. been doing, and keep up the good work. Thank you very and much. That comes from the East Shore Freshwater Habitat Society. Thanks. Well, I hope we get to do some restoration I'm together sure out in Crawford will. Bay. Looking forward to it. Great. What is the success rate of the uh, saplings or the trees that you plant? Yes. Have you established that yet? Yeah. So. Because we used, um, they're called live stake cuttings, as you saw, they're really tall. Um, so normally get better survival rate with that than like the kind of smaller shrubs that you can buy from other nurseries. Although we found that this year is really harsh for new plants. Like we put them in in November and the hot, it just got, I don't know about where you guys are from, but around here, it just got cold in a hurry with no snow and then warmed up. So I think our survival rate was maybe 80, 85 percent. So the, I wanted it to be higher. But. The Arrow Lakes were mm -hmm. planted uh, about four or five years ago, and uh, the uh, survival rate is something like less than five percent. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the problems was uh, these uh, parts of the trees, how I'll call them, uh, they were planted along uh, the foreshore private properties. The owners came along behind and just yanked them out again. And in areas where there has been no disturbance, uh, it's just a course of success for them. That's the thing I'm finding is like, even if you're doing work on the foreshore, if it's in front of somebody's private property, whether you like it or not, I feel like you have to do your due diligence to consult with them. Because even, like you're saying, even though they didn't have to legally, maybe had they communicated a bit, they would have had those residents out there watering the plants rather than taking them out. So I think, like, to me, that kind of indicates that you, there was kind of a step missed, that if you don't tell people why you're doing the work you're doing and how it can benefit them and their children down the line kind of thing, and just take a real like non-emotional approach. I think that, yeah, I can I can see that happening. I can see that people feel like the foreshore in front of their property is theirs, and there's this really deeply instilled philosophy about believing that the beach in front of yours is yours. So there's a lot of issues that can arise from that. Just yeah. a comment on the the air lake survivability. That was actually. BC Hydro Project, and they're planted within yeah. the drawdown zone of the reservoir. Yes. So this is right in the active drawdown zones so that are flooded out with mostly the indigenous edge and the vegetation there. Yes. So it died more from operating conditions of the reservoir than actually where it was planted. It's on a poor design to begin with. Yeah. kind of expected. I think so, yes. But there is, for anyone who wants to do wetland work out there, feel free to call me, and I'm happy to share anything that I know. Um, there's lots of money for it right now. The Fish and Wildlife Compensation Program actually has a wetlands action plan. So, you know, there's a really, it feels like there's a lot of building momentum about people actually valuing wetlands and being willing to invest the dollar bills behind it. So, I think that there's a lot of potential in future. Yeah. How, do you, how are you getting along with the mosquito control folks? So, um, we did have some concerns over that, but I have kind of my standby response on that, that if you have a healthy functioning wetland, you actually have less mosquitoes than if you have uh, just, let's say, an agricultural field that has a flooded area. You're more likely to get, like, where mosquitoes love is the calm, non-flow water. So those tires in your backyard or that buck rain barrel, that's where you get a lot of the mosquitoes. And I think the best way to mitigate that concern is put some bat boxes up on your project, put some swallow box, put those mosquito eaters, and then you can build a healthy wetland, combine it with attracting some mosquito eaters, and I think you can address that problem. I was wondering if 
if there was any way to document your success over time, because I think that's a really, there's a lot of projects going on, and if, if there are some indicators that you're gonna use with that. So, I mean, our indicators, like a big reason we did the project was for, in that upper wetland area, was improving the western toad breeding. So we set up that citizen science community monitoring group, and we're hoping that they'll do that, like, perpetually. So that is one aspect of the project that will be monitored in the long term, but it really depends on how gung-ho those that crew is, and I think they're pretty gung-ho, so I'm hopeful. But um, one thing I find challenging is getting the money to maintain your project. <coughs> Funders, I find a lot of times, like the multi-year funding thing is not always easy, and I find the biggest mistake people make with wetland restoration projects is not putting enough cash in for your maintenance. So you want to leave at least 10% of your total project funding for maintenance. Um, and it's kind of a sidebar, but I think that that plays into your monitoring question, because if you don't put money into monitor, then how are you going to do it? So, yeah. Maybe one more and then I'll pass it over to Reagan. Perspective, I'm just curious to know, like, for all that money, like, what is this area, like, what is the actual size of that area? Like? Actually, I just went out with Amy with FWCP to map out the exact area. Um, but it, it depends, and I was going through a bit of a head scratcher, like this area is probably, you know, a couple acres, that's probably, you know, where we actually planted it, affected area, probably a couple acres, and then this area, I don't think it's fair to claim the whole pond area, because we just planted trees, so I have to do a polygon just on the tree area we planted. Um, so I don't know the total number yet, I'm just kind of doing all my post-project analysis right now. Um, but I'll pass it over to Reagan, and she can tell you about some uh, cool work that she's doing out here. I think this is yours. Thank you. Me. Thank you, Claire. So that project really inspired us. I'm Reagan Mountain with um, Living Lakes Canada. Um, and this summer, we are going to begin our pilot project to construct a Kootenai, the Kootenai Lake Stormwater Treatment Wetland um, in Lakeside Park, Stuck Bay, right here in Nelson. Um, so the project will be used, uh, will use a constructed wetland as a natural filtration solution. Uh, this wetland will treat the stormwater runoff entering Kootenai Lake from Lakeside Park and the parking lot there. Um, and so if you guys take a walk down by Lakeside Park, it's just that bay right there where that interpretive signage is, um, and there's a stormwater outflow right there. Um, and so stormwater can carry uh, heavy metals, toxic contaminants, and pathogens, and have negative impacts on water quality. And so the constructed wetland that we're going to build will um, work to mitigate these impacts through biofiltration. Um, so building on examples and lessons learned from our Living Lakes International Partners, uh, the project will include water quality monitoring conducted by community volunteers and citizen scientists um, to assess the project's success and degree of improved water quality. So we'll actually be taking a boat right out in Duck Bay and collecting the water quality samples there. Um, we're also going to include uh, some invasive species weed poles and native species planting days um, and we've already included and will again next year include local grade 8 students through the local Know Your Watershed um, program to help with uh, water monitoring planting and provide an opportunity to learn about local urban water systems, water quality issues and wetlands. And so we had about three field trips already with the grade 8 students from Trafalgar. Um, partnered up with Wild Sites um, Education Program and Monica Neeson and the kids love seeing the wetlands, that was really cool. Um, the project will be implemented in phases while we're receiving partial funding and this summer will include pre-restoration water quality monitoring, um, like I said the invasive species weed pull and the native species planting days. Um, yeah, and so the project will provide a wide variety of paid and volunteer opportunities um, we'll work with Claire, um, building off all of that awesome knowledge that she already shared with you and her experience doing it um, in like a mentorship capacity. 
Um, and so part we'll partner with many other community groups as well. Hopefully you see KISS and they can help us with the native species and maybe with like the weed, um, weed pull as well. Um, and it will provide a meaningful hands-on learning opportunity for youth groups and building cross-generational relationships, cultural strengths, and healthy neighborhoods. Um, we already have support from the city of Nelson and um, yeah, so we worked with them and it aligns with many of their uh, 2040 sustainability strategies, um, including their focus areas of energy and climate change, land use, and natural areas, recreation, and leisure. So the wetland project promotes community water stewardship and engagement with our watershed and Kootenai Lake, because we love it. So if you or anyone you know is interested in helping us with this project, um, please send me an email, um, and so the majority of it will be happening this summer come August. So, thank you.